Well, thank you to those who have come along and for those joining online. Uh, I'm David Whitehurst. I'm an associate professor and co-lead of the BC Support Unit Health Economics and Simulation Modeling. Um, a lot of the work that we do is to try and foster um, advances in patient-oriented health economics research, which ties in nicely to today's talk. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Eric Winsberg. Eric is um, Professor of Philosophy at the University of South Florida. He specializes in philosophy of science, especially the role of models and simulations for decision making. Um, he's speaking today about value judgments in modeling and causal inference for decision making, a fascinating and extremely topical um, issue. So Eric's in town because he has a few collaborations with local researchers, particularly the great work of uh, Stephanie Harvard here at the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. So we have the room for about two hours, plenty of time for discussion and questions. I think Eric is happy to be interrupted if there are questions, but if you prefer to leave your questions to the end, that is um, absolutely fine. So please join me in welcoming Eric Bristol. Thank you. Great, so thanks for having me. And uh, I think for a while there, I kept being like, I'm not so sure if I can do a Zoom talk, bear with me if things go wrong, but now it's like I haven't done, this is my first actual live in-person talk in almost two years now. So probably be things going wrong in that way. Okay, so the title of the talk is Value Judgments in Modeling and Causal Inference. Um, and uh, the two main themes here are going to be, uh, well, two closely related themes. One is, um, what role do values play in using models to learn about the world in such a way that we can make decisions? Um, and uh, the second is, what is the point of public participation um, in model building and in using models to make decisions. Um, and the, the sort of overarching theme is going to be that um, uh, I think for us, for both, for both me and Stephanie, uh, the, the, the crucial insight is that the point of um, public participation in modeling is that modeling involves value judgments and that um, in general, Right, people who are uh, the kinds of experts who have the epistemic skills to do modeling um, and to learn about the world in ways that decision makers need aren't necessarily better situated to have the right values uh, to go into that. Right, that values are for the most part things that we think um, everybody has a say in. So those are going to be kind of uh, that's going to be the kind of major theme here. Right to talk about the role that values play in model building and in using models to make inferences um, and to sort of remind people that it's because of the role that values play there. Um, or so at least that's what we think is the main reason that uh, it's important to have public participation in model building. And I think that then gives us a little bit of insight into not just why, but you know, it hopefully will be useful knowing that for thinking about in what ways uh, ought the public be uh, invited to participate in, um, in modeling, particularly um, health economic modeling, which is kind of what's of interest here. Okay, so um, uh, there's a sort of large literature in philosophy of science about um, the role of values in science. And there's a term that's, that's been kind of bantered around a lot called inductive risk. And, People often say that the best argument for there being uh, an ineliminable role of values in scientific inference is because of epistemic, uh, is because of inductive risk. Uh, and one point that I think I want to make today is that um, we think that that is a slightly uh, oversimplified sense in which uh, values play a role in scientific inference. And in fact, we think there are two kinds of risk. So I want to kind of open by telling you about what I think are the two kinds of risk. And here by risk, I mean, right, things that could go wrong when you're doing science. And I think there's sort of two different kinds of things that can go wrong when you're doing science. And both of those, right, it's when things can go wrong, right, it's when you have to make choices, even though things might go wrong, that values play a particularly central role. That's gonna be a major theme as well. Okay, so one kind of risk, one kind of risk, 
is what's known as inductive risk. And this is a sort of standard term in the philosophical literature. And the idea is simply this, right? Um, that when you do science, uh, you are often, right, going beyond the evidence. You're making inferences about which you cannot be 100% certain, right? And that moreover, when you go beyond the available evidence, there's no God-given threshold uh, of how much evidence you need to have before you accept the hypothesis that you're considering or reject the hypothesis that you're considering, okay? So if you think about this, if you have kind of Bayesian inclinations and you think that evidence gives you some, you know, in virtue of the evidence, you might think it's 60% likely that the hypothesis is true or 70% likely that the hypothesis is true. There's no, there's no God-given threshold, right? When the evidence says the hypothesis is 70% likely, that's when I should accept it, or when it's 90% likely, right? Um, and so the thought is um, that what tells you, what informs in cases where one is trying to make uh, an inductive leap in science, which we do all the time, when you're trying to decide what is a sufficient degree of evidence, the most important consideration is what would be the harm of being wrong one way or the other, right? So if you want to think about it in terms of type one error and type two error, right? Type one error, right? You accept the hypothesis even though it's false, right? What would be the harm of that? Type two error, you reject the hypothesis even though it's true. What would be the harm of that? This is an argument made by Richard Rudner way back in the 1950s. His favorite example was, right? If you're evaluating, uh, the hypothesis, and I kid you not, this is the example, that a vaccine is safe, right? Um, and you're also evaluating the hypothesis that some lot of belt buckles that's come off the factory floor is not defective, right? His view was the degree of confidence you ought to have in the hypothesis that the vaccine is safe needs to be higher than the degree of uh, confidence you have in the hypothesis that a lot of belt buckles is not defective. Why? Because the harm of saying that a vaccine is safe when it isn't is higher than the harm of saying that a batch of belt buckles is non-defective when it isn't, right? And that reflects our value judgment. There's a very famous philosopher of science by the name of Boston Frossen, who uh, I was talking about this to once, and he was just, you know, making, making a joke to make the obvious point. He's well known to be a rock climber, and he said, well, for me, right, it's much more important that the belt buckles not be defective. But that's, that illustrates the point, right? That illustrates the point, right? What makes, something, what makes something a mistake is objective, but what the harm of that mistake would be is a matter of your values, right? And it's the, it's the harm of the mistake that informs what degree of evidence you have to have had before you accept or reject that hypothesis. That was Rudner's argument. We, we think that there's a kind of overlooked, um, there's an overlooked other kind of risk that happens in science, and it happens sort of earlier in the process. So um, the, 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 the claim here is that there's risk involved whenever you build a representational tool. So what do I mean by representational tool? Um, I kind of mean this very broadly to include things like choosing a methodology, adopting a data set, right, uh, or building a model. And, but today, right, for obvious reasons, I'm gonna focus mainly on this idea of building a model, right? A model is a representational tool. Why is it a representational tool? It's representational because we build it in order to kind of picture the world for us, right? Um, and it's a tool because we may use it often for making inferences about the world, and making inferences in particular, right, this is, I think, when it gets most interesting, using it to make inferences about what we ought to do, right? Ought we to roll out the vaccine in this way or that way? Ought we to require that people wear masks or not? Ought we to um, get this drug available in the uh, Canadian healthcare system or not, right? So we use models very often to inform decision making. And we think that there's a kind of risk involved in, uh, in building the model that's somewhat or at least sufficiently independent from the kind of risk that's involved with accepting or rejecting a hypothesis, right? 
even though, of course, we recognize that at the end of the day, often what we want to do is use a model to accept or reject a hypothesis, right? We also think there's a sufficiently kind of independent kind of risk involved in building a representation. And we think it's worth talking about two different kinds of risk. Good. So um, the, the, the sort of canonical kind of risk that you have here when you're building a model is um, what should you represent in the model? We all know, right? Models do things out. They include something and they do something out. So that's a. Um, that was called your face. Yeah, 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 I think it was working okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, if, it, if it goes bad, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. Okay. okay. So um, we we have um, we have we choose right what features of the world to represent the model, what not to represent. And we also make choices once we've decided to include something. We make choices about how to represent it. Right. So um, if I'm uh, building the famous Imperial College of London model uh, of COVID spread, right, I might include. Um, in the in the model that some people go to work and some people go to school, right? But I might leave out of the model as they did that some people live in at the care living facility, right? Um, and I also once I decide to include the fact that some people go to school and some people go to work, I need to represent. I need to choose how to represent those facts in terms of like what I think the transmission dynamics are in a school, what I think they are in a workplace. Yes, there, there are there are um, there are two kinds of decisions there. Although they, they do kind of get blurry a little bit. Um, and uh, why are those why are those why are those risks why are those risks sort of involve values? Well, because first of all, right, um, making representational choices in a model can of course influence um, claims that get adopted downstream, right? If you build a coding model and it says, right, um, closing schools will cut transmission by X amount, that conclusion might be wrong and there might be harms that flow from that conclusion being wrong. But also, right, here there are, I think, other ways in which representational choices um, they can provide uh, answers to irrelevant or harmful questions. And that, you not, that shouldn't be overlooked, right? So, for example, Right. Um, if you ask the question, should schools be closed for a whole year in the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, some people might think, right, somebody might have the value that says it's sort of kind of dangerous to even ask that question. That's such a terrible possibility to contemplate. We don't think that we want that question asked. Right. Um, uh, and, and second of all, right, um, uh, making a model in a certain sort of way can obscure important information, right? Arguably, when the ICL team neglected to put um, assisted care living facilities into their model, that obscured important information. Um, we, we know that's especially important information, right? Uh, a year, year and a half down the line, because we know that's in fact where a lot of the worst COVID outcomes occurred. Okay. Um, who cares about values? Why should you care about the fact that values are implicated in both of these kinds of things, both in um, accepting hypotheses and in building models? Because um, uh, the idea is that there are two sort of important lessons of this, right? Um, I think the first one I straightforwardly believe, and the second one I believe, although I, I don't exactly know how it should go. So the first one is, if you're going to do stuff like this, you're going to build models that implicitly invoke values, be transparent about it, right? Make it clear, right? I built this model, and when I built this model, I decided that it wasn't that important to include such and such. Or I built this model, and when I included such and such, I realized, right, that that made it seem maybe more likely than it would have to make it seem like closing schools is a good idea, but that's because I think protecting people's health is maybe more important in some respect or other than assuring that children get education. Right? So just be, be, be forthcoming right, when you build models about if there were value considerations like that. And, and, and in a sense, I, I would argue that they really are, 
right? People coming about what those are. And then the second one is, um, and I think this is something that uh, we need to do more work on. So I hope people don't press me too hard on how I think this should happen because I don't really know yet. But I do think it suggests that when models are being built to have um, serious ramifications for the public in various ways, that we not just be transparent about what value is going to them, but that we um, solicit public and stakeholder input on what the values ought to be uh, that go into the model. And I'll say a little bit at the end about um, you know, sort of future work, but I think this is going to be uh, a key feature of that. Okay, um, I think I've already said this, right? But we think the primary purpose of public involvement in modeling is about managing value judgments, right? Um, it's a clear reason for invoking the public in model building, um, and it provides, I think, some clue as to what public involvement in model building ought to look like, given that we know, right, that um, most members of the public, um, and it's going to include me, right, uh, don't have um, actual skills at you know, building models and making the relevant inferences and collecting the relevant data or whatever. But so kind of gives us, when people talk about public participation, and someone asks, well, gee, why would you want public participation by people who don't know anything about the science? This kind of gives us a little bit of a clue as to where, where that proper input, input can come. Um, okay. Uh, so I want to talk as an example uh, about, um, so I'm going to show you screenshots of two different papers. Uh, one of these is by um, one of your colleagues, or two of your colleagues, I guess. Or, or they all, they all colleagues here. Um, first two here. First two here. So this is a, uh, this is a model built about um, the uh, AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. And I take it the central question, this was at the time when people were particularly worried about um, the AZ vaccine possibly having a side effect profile that was worse than some of its alternatives, particularly with respect to uh, EITC, which I won't try to pronounce what that stands for, but basically sort of very dangerous blood box. Um, uh, and so the idea was like, well, uh, should we use that vaccine to have a bunch of it, to get it out there early, or should we allow people to have to wait for the availability of, a, of an alternative vaccine, and then in the meantime, right, have them be uh, having to face the virus unvaccinated. So that was the point of the model. And um, uh, uh, four of us, um, myself, Stephanie Amin, who was one of the authors of the, of the original paper, um, and a colleague of mine at the University of Kansas named John Simmons, we wrote a paper kind of talking about, he's walking through this example as an example of how value judgments come into a model and why it might be useful in a model like that um, to invoke public participation. Okay, so again, right, um, I said earlier, the two kinds of decisions that go into model building are what to represent and how to represent it. Um, so what goes into, what was, what went into, what was represented in the, in this AZ model, right? Um, so here's a question you might have right away, right? One question you might have, this is the biggest what to represent question you can have when you're building a model, is that, that should you do this at all? And you can imagine, you can imagine, right, the public might have one of three views about this. Um, one would be, Let's not even study this, right? Vaccination is so important, so obviously important, that even raising the possibility in people's minds that this vaccine might be unsafe is just morally heinous, right? We ought to just go ahead with the vaccine. Um, a second one would be, no, unequivocally, right? If you aren't sure that a vaccine is safe, you must hold it immediately. I don't want to hear about your model. So there's two kinds of people who might say, I just don't like the very idea of this modeling project because I think it's just absolutely morally clear that everybody should be vaccinated as soon as soon as possible. Or, right, I think it's absolutely morally clear that we should never use a vaccine that um, we know might possibly have, but let's even put it three, four weekly, that we might know 
uh, has a slightly worse safety profile than an available alternative that's out there in the world somewhere. Right, and then a third group might say, well, we need more information. We want we want to see the kind of model um, that this group made because we want to know how to balance these risks. Okay. So right away, there's a value-making question about whether to build a model like this in the first place. Good. Um, what to represent? Uh, so a core judgment then um, is, is this a good idea? Should we build a model like this, right? Um, uh, so you might ask the public, right, at the very beginning. You might say, like, is this the kind of thing you want? You want your, you want your experts and forming policymakers to want them to even model this? Or do you think that there's a clear moral duty on one side or the other? Okay, but more, more getting into the fine-grained details of the model, right? Um, here are some outcomes that you can choose to represent in the model. So yeah, I think these are the ones that actually are included in the model. Um, first of all, obviously, right, um, COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, deaths. Um, the model, I think, considers cases of long COVID, right? Um, and of course, it considers cases of, uh, of BIPT. Um, and right, by putting those, by putting those into the model, and leaving other things out of the model, you're making, a, you're signaling a pretty clear moral commitment to these being um, the most important and most salient outcomes that can result as that can come as a result of either vaccinating with the uh, AZ vaccine or waiting for uh, the availability of one of its alternatives, right? Um, and it signals, more importantly, right, um, that those things are more important. Right, as the slide says, actually completely trouble them since they're not even in the model at all. Right, things like how much is the vaccine going to cost the government to pay for? Um, uh, are there uh, non-fatal, right, or less serious than BIPT, AZ vaccine-induced events? Um, right, those are not represented in the model. And when you don't represent, right, when you don't represent those things in the model, you're making it clear. Right? You're making it clear that on your value, right, there's no number of, let's say, medium severity adverse effects of this vaccine that could possibly tip the scales one way or the other. That's just built into the model. It's impossible. Even if even if five million Canadians might be able to get some moderately serious adverse effects from the vaccine, there's just no way for that number, no matter how large it gets, to tip the scales because it's not in the model, and that's clearly a moral judgment. That's clearly a moral judgment that these kinds of outcomes at the top, right, don't, aren't just more important to be done here, but that no number of these can balance out even a single one of them. And that's, I think, pretty clearly a moral judgment. Um, more on, like, what to represent. There are sort of choices of variables that you can put into, right? So those are those are the, we can talk about what outcomes go into the model or come out of the model, but then we also have to talk about what input, right? What are the variables in the model that can make the model count off one COVID death or one COVID hospitalization or one COVID case or one case of EIPT? Um, and things that went into the model, right? Uh, things that went into the model were things like the age of British Columbians, their sex, um, their frontline worker status. Um, those things did go into the model, but things like people's race, people's um, incomes, their postal code, um, their occupations, right, um, their household size, right, those were not variables that drove the model one way or the other. And and that signals, right, that's not just signals, but it, 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 it instantiates the moral commitment that even if, let's say, um, indigenous people are more adversely affected for whatever reason by a choice that would make, that doesn't matter. All that, ha all that matters is what happens to the average British Columbian. Or if it turns out that, right, this um, 
with particular strategies that the law ends up recommending, right, is better for people who work at home on Zoom than it is for people who work in heat packing plants. That can't come out of the model, right? Because that's not a variable in the model. And by not putting that variable into the model, you are unequivocally making the moral commitment that this is not a relevant fact. What matters with respect to all of these omitted variables is simply what happens to the average person, right? It doesn't matter whether all the bad ones happen to um, indigenous people or to black people. It doesn't matter if all of the bad, bad outcomes happen to people who are urban places. It doesn't matter if all the bad outcomes are happening to people who work this kind of job rather than that kind of job, except, except with respect to whether they're frontline workers or not. Okay, so um, so all of these, all of these are. I think this is really this is a really important point here, right? Um, I think this is both a point that philosophers of science who talk about values in science, but also model makers are not sufficiently in tune with. And it's that it's not just when we accept and reject hypotheses that moral judgments get made. It's also when we actually choose how to represent the world in a model, right? that we are staking out moral commitments here. We're staking out a moral commitment in that. Um, and, right, if, if it's the case, if it's the case that, for example, um, for whatever reason, I either won't or can't put race into the model, it then becomes perfectly clear that the model is inadequate for answering any question where race is part of the question. Right? If anybody wants to ask of this model, is it really not being worse for indigenous people? You can't answer it. And you might want to know, okay, um, does the public still want a model like that? Does the public say, look, just put it in there? Or if the public you say back to the public, we just don't have big enough data to do that in any sort of useful and meaningful way, does the public still want a model that um, that's race blind in that way? Or that's like um, you know, occupation blind in that kind of way. Okay. Um, uh, and, and, and furthermore, right, it's, I think some people might say in a case like that, look, if we just don't have, we just don't have data on our race, what do you do? I'll differentiate between how, um, you know, white people and black people or indigenous people get affected by these choices, and they are made of the tie, they just couldn't do it. I think that's wrong, right? Because we always have two alternatives. One, to just not make the model at all, right? That's always a possible choice. Or B, to just whatever crappy version of that is possible, right? That's also always, right? You could always just guess. You could always just guess, well, you know, I don't know, but it just seems plausible that, say, people who work at home, right, um, are less likely to get COVID than people who don't. Let's make them, oh, I don't know, 20% more likely. Right? And, you know, that's, a, that's maybe a crude choice. It's maybe one that you couldn't justify very well. But it's a moral choice to do that or not do that and just leave race out of it altogether. Okay. Um, uh, right? Um, and, of course, whenever you make a representational choice like this, Right? Whenever you make a representational choice like this, there's a risk, right? Just as there's a risk, whenever you whenever you conclude that a hypothesis is true or false, there's always the downstream harm of being wrong, of accepting it when it's false or rejecting it when it's true. When you make a representational choice, the risk is that it will not be adequate to the purpose to which you think your model ought to be put. And the downstream harms of that, right, are uh, gaps in knowledge. Pernicious gaps in knowledge. So, for example, if the public thinks that um, a model like this needs to be informative about differential outcomes with respect to race, and it doesn't do that, there's a harm, right? There's a harm of this gap in our knowledge, and it's an ethical question how bad that harm is. Not an epistemic question, it's an ethical question, right? How bad that harm is. There's the, the risk of damage to public trust. Bit of that um, over the last 18 months with some modeling projects that have taken place. Um, and of course, there's the risk of downstream endorsement of false claims, which just then becomes inductive. Uh, okay, so 
Um, this is sort of a central claim of, of a paper that Stephanie and I wrote together, just trying to convince philosophers of science that uh, Oh, Moses, did you have a question? Sorry. Uh, yeah, Eric, uh, sorry, you said we can interrupt you. Is it okay? Yeah, please. So I, I, I have just one question that is kind of uh, bugging me for a long time in, in, in modeling exactly, is that sometimes if you want to bring those representational factors into the model, how about uh, equity in decision-making? I'm going to make a grossly simplistic example for the sake of argument. Uh, in COPD, my disease of interest, like the quality of care women receive is generally lower than the quality of care that men receive. There is empirical evidence all over the place from multiple jurisdictions. If I go ahead and, and model like sex or gender as a variable in my, in my model, then the chances are I might not recommend a treatment for women because it is not cost effective for them because they are not receiving high quality care, they are not receiving those follow-up calls, they, they, as a result, the adherence level is lower among them. So how would, is, is that type of concern relevant to what you're talking or you want to like categorize it in a different part of modeling? No, I think that's an absolutely fantastic example for what we want to talk about, right? That's an absolutely fantastic example. If I got, if I, if I got the general idea right. So the, so the idea is, if I got this right, you have a medical intervention, and it, 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 it's better for men than it is for women, but not intrinsically so. It's just because when women go to eat this intervention, they get inadequate, they get inadequately served by the healthcare team. Is that, is that the gist? Yeah, and if you go ahead and yeah. model that variable, uh, uh, like, then we end up perpetuating the inequality. So we intentionally... Yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah. absolutely, so those are, those are beautiful cases of conflicting representational risk which I think the inductive risk literature is impoverished with respect to, because there, there's hormone, as you point out, very, very aptly, there's harm on both sides, right? If you include this in the model, you may just end up then recommending that women not even get this care. And that might be quite a bit worse than them going to get the care and being inadequately served. But if you don't put it in the model, you're obscuring an incredibly important fact that the public might want to know. Namely, that women are getting crappy treatment for this when they go to the hospital. So um, that's just not a decision. I think this is a great example of a decision that no degree of epistemic expertise can help you settle. Right? Which one of those is worse? Mm -hmm. um, uh, if I were building a model like that, right? particularly if I was in a room that consisted entirely of men building a model like that, I'd probably pick up the phone and say, is there any, are there any people or groups of people or representatives of women's groups or whatever that we could get to come in here and help inform us about what the public wants in a case like that? Which risk would they rather take, right? Because it's unavoidable, at least for the moment, that you take one or the other. Would they rather, right, would they rather take what probably is the, the bigger immediate harm, namely that the mall is going to say women shouldn't go for this procedure, but then sweep under the rug the problem that women are getting poorer care, or would they rather take the short-term harm, right, in the hope that this will shed light on a more structural, fundamental problem, right? That's just, that's a perfect example of a representational choice that a scientist has to make but we probably can't make on behalf of the public. The great, I think it's a beautiful, I, mean, I, I want to get that example into a paper at some point, because it's a fantastic example of a real um, modeling choice dilemma, right, that is not an epistemic one, it's a moral one. Does that make sense? Of course, yeah, I have to process your response, but yeah, you don't want us to sweep it under the carpet only because it might make inequalities persist. It, it, there is a choice there. Yeah, thank you. Exactly, but there's harm on both sides. There's harm on both <laughs> sides, yeah. Okay, so, um, right, with the quest, with respect to how to represent something, right, um, in, in, the, in, in the paper, I think this is right, remember, right, in the paper, the authors um, admit the fact that there are different estimates 
of the rate of DIPP for AZ vaccine. There's one that comes from the Canadian data set, site, a, a data source, one that comes from a European data source. Should you use one? Should you use the other? Should you average of the two? Right? Any choice you make is going to have a predictable, right? It's going to have a predictable downstream effect on what you choose to do. If it's, if it's obvious that if you look at them and go, oh, the, the Canadian estimate of the ACP is lower than the European one, you know that by picking the Canadian one, you're going to make it more likely that the model ends up telling you to go ahead and vaccinate. If you pick the European one, you know it's going to make it more likely to halt the vaccine. If you average the two, you know it's going to be, you know, something. none of those is a morally neutral choice, right? None of those is a morally neutral choice. Um, so, uh, so, you know, and of course, right, of course, any model like the one uh, that with, with, with this, with this uh, vaccine model where you're modeling COVID spread with a compartment model, right, you have to, you know, you, you have to have this now quite mythical number that we all are obsessed with, right, what's the R value of COVID, you go up with the variant, whatever, right, you have to choose a, a, a value of R. Or you could, or you could do a sensitivity analysis over a range of values. That doesn't alleviate the problem how you pick endpoints or you know end values for that range of, of values of R, right? And if you if you don't put don't put let's say R equals seven into the model as a as a value that sample, then anybody who thinks that the R value might be as high as seven can't use your result, right? They can't they can't do anything. Um, and then of course, right. Of course, uh, if you don't put into the model, right, what the risk of death and COVID is, conditional on very demographic factors, right? If you don't put into the model, I don't know, probably uh, the things off the top of my head, but I think we're probably right that men are more likely to die than women, that um, uh, in the United States, at least African Americans are more likely to die than white people, that, um, et cetera, that old, obviously older people. Uh, are more likely to die. You know, people I think that is in the model, right? But um, uh, that people who are who have a certain kind of job are more likely to expose to the virus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? If you if you put those if you put those into the model, then various outcomes, of course. And then of course, just the very choice um, to use an SIR model that has an R value rather than some kind of agent-based model, whether it could be heterogeneity or seasonality of the virus or whatever. Um, I'm I'm still sort of pleased that uh, we, we now kind of know that the vaccine probably wanes over time, and we know that various regions seem to have seasonal patterns to COVID outbreaks, but we haven't really ever thought about trying to tie these things together. I'm a little bit amazed about that myself, but maybe that's um, just a little bit too much personal speculation there. Okay, anyway, these are all variables that you could or could not put into the model, all of which have um, moral implications. Good, okay. Um, so, and finally, right, finally questions of what to represent and how to represent them overlap a little bit, right? So for example, if I decide to include race in the model, now I have a whole host of questions that I have to answer that I didn't use to ask. How does race affect employment? How does race affect employment in such a way that it might impact probability of infection? How does race impact probability of death or hospitalization conditional on uh, infection, et cetera, et cetera? So choices of what to represent immediately give rise to choices uh, of how to represent, and then choices of how to represent then give rise to questions about what you know what to represent. So if you you know if you decide to represent race. Are you going to represent, you know, if you're in the United States, are you going to represent uh, just, you know, before uh, five, I guess, five OMB races, right? Or are you going to include, uh, you know, whether you're Hispanic or not? Are you going to include mixed race? All kinds of questions arise as soon as you decide to include or not include something into a model. Okay, and finally, right, finally, um, this is, I think, a really, uh, Here, um, which is uh, what's the goal of all this? What's the what, what, you know, when you're building a model? How do you reflect on what the goal of the very policy you're trying to inform is? Right. So 
very different, different people have very different conceptions of what the benefits of vaccination are. Um, and I'm quite familiar with people on both sides of the space, right? Some people who think that the purpose of vaccination is to offer people the ability to protect themselves. Um, whereas other people think that the point of the vaccination is to get the most number of people possible vaccinated, right? So then we can perhaps have community protection if in fact the vaccine is capable of offering that, right? So, but, but, but that might really, really fundamentally affect what you think some of the risks of this are. So just to give you an example, I didn't particularly sort of example, but, but, uh, but I saw it. There was a paper that came out two weeks ago, maybe a month ago or so, that tried to estimate the degree of protection uh, against infection, this is against infection, not, not any kind of serious infection, but the degree of protection against infection of natural immunity from past infection versus vaccination. And the study suggested that the former was 10 times stronger than the latter. In other words, that natural infection was 10 times more protective than, than vaccine. Set aside for the moment what the quality of that study was, whether you think that hypothesis is true or not. I encountered the number of people who said, that's true. Even if there's good evidence for that, we should not, we should not, you know, that's bad framing to let that be out there, right? We should not even be saying something that even sounds like or rhymes like, rhymes with a claim, it's better for you to get infected than vaccinated. Of course not, you know, of course not a logical thing to infer from that study, even if it's true. But people thought the fact that that study result even rhymes with a claim that that dangerous to public health suggests we shouldn't even ever say something like that, right? So if you think if you think that the goal of vaccination policy is to protect, allow people to protect themselves to the best degree possible, you might really think about the modeling project quite a bit differently than if you think the goal of vaccination policy is really a public health one. In the public health case, right, if you're the most extreme public healthy sort of person, you might say something like this. You know, if this model reveals that women between 30 and 40 actually face a little bit more risk of death from BITT than from COVID, they might not get vaccinated themselves. And that might cause more deaths among 80 year old Canadians than would be caused by the BITT. And another person might say, oh my God, that's the most heinous suggestion I've ever heard, that you want to sacrifice women between the age of 30, even if it's a smaller number, right? You want to force them to take on that risk, um, even though you're, yes, I agree, you're protecting, you're preventing more deaths than many other people, but my God, right? This is not, can you can imagine somebody having, I don't know which is the correct moral view there, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to prejudge that, but those are really profoundly different um, uh, moral considerations one might have about what the goal of a vaccination program is, right? Um, that really might affect how you think about representational risk um, in a case like that. Uh, okay. Um, I think, how, how am I on time? How, what should I? Yeah, maybe I'll just actually kind of, I'm gonna skip a bunch of stuff here, I think. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about this this other paper that, uh, um, that Stephanie and I uh, uh, wrote, um, and just say a little bit about um, when, uh, when you should be doing um, scientific inference, when you should be doing modeling or causal inference or anything, when you should be doing science um, that's publicly relevant, uh, and what, what ought to be goals. And I guess our view kind of came down to this, Right? You really ought only do this kind of scientific work if you think that the output of your work is in the ballpark of being suitable for doing something like, and I've been lectured all weekend about the differences between these different expressions. In my vocabulary, there's just cost benefit analysis. But apparently, 
for you guys, there's a difference between cost benefit analysis and harm benefit analysis and cost outcomes and cost effectiveness analysis, and maybe even, um, okay, anyway, right? Um, to my mind, right, the, just the most generic expression in my ADOX, right, is um, cost benefit analysis. And cost there doesn't necessarily have to mean money. It just means there's a ledger over here. You make a science, you make a hypothesis. And that decision is has the potential to cause some harm. It has the potential to cause some benefit. And your job is just to, you know, um, estimate the probabilities of those things, and then somehow, right, uh, try to represent these things. The public values are in such a way that those, um, those, those, uh, those goods and bads, right, can be given something like a weighting. Um, and uh. Uh, we just thought, right, it, it was worth sort of highlighting the following uh, facts about what kinds of considerations ought to be in place before uh, before you try to do that kind of work, right? You should ask yourself, I think, right, um, is it plausible, is it plausible that we can generate good estimates of expected outcomes under an alternative option, right? Or is this just too hard? Um, do we know something about the desirability weights of the different things? Or do we simply not have enough information about what the public cares about? Um, uh, have we then identified, right? Have we identified the decision relevant thresholds to help us choose between options, right? Um, uh, for example, right? I mean, right, very early in the pandemic, when people were running models showing that various non-pharmaceutical non interventions could or couldn't save certain numbers of lives, it was all that nobody was talking about, right? How much are we going to pay, right? How much are we actually going to pay to save a life? Because it's very, I mean, that does sound in some sense, of course, horrible, but, right, if you, if you don't bring this in, if you don't bring this into play, pretty soon you might find yourself deciding, right, that, it's fine to close schools for a year for all children, right, to save one person's life. Um, and I doubt many of us, I doubt many of us would 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 um would 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 be at least think it's obvious that that has to be the right answer. So um so we kind of tried to make the point in this paper, right, that these are things you ought to think about. Um <coughs> it, these are things you ought to think about before you're even Sort of embarking on uh, embarking on the project of claiming that you're doing the kind of science that can inform policy, particularly I think in a kind of emergency situation like the one that we were facing, right? Because um, because uh, there's ultimately right there's always another available kind of decision making that's available to policymakers. I think there's sort of two fundamentally different kinds of they can do cost benefit analysis, and you can do that when they have this kind of information that's at least a moderately good quality. Or they can do something like doing the analysis. They can say something like, look, um, uh, it's our basic fundamental duty to protect people's lives from disease. Or, look, it's our basic fundamental duty to ensure that our children are being educated. Or, Look, it's our basic fundamental duty to ensure that people are able to uh, freely worship, right? Uh, so maybe it's just off the table to close churches and synagogues, right? I don't know, right? Um, but uh, what, what I think one wants to avoid, and what I think um, Stephanie, I think, sometimes makes happen, is that politicians are in fact doing something more like duty analysis and then sort of hunting for models or scientific inferences that are just meant to make it look like what they think is their duty uh, is supported by some kind of science. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mostly wrap it up there. I just want to um, want to just talk about a couple of um, projects that. Um, uh, these are really Stephanie's projects. These were both 
uh, funded by the Michael Smith Foundation. Um, and, and Stephanie is the, the brainchild, or the, or the brainchild behind both of these um, grants. The first um, is done, mostly done. This is a series of videos uh, that uh, I'm going to say Stephanie and I, she always makes me say that, but it's really her, uh, made these videos about the role of values and modeling. It's a seven, uh, seven episode series. It's, so it's just on YouTube now, right? So um, if anybody's interested in that, you should get in touch with Stephanie about that um, and have a look at them. I think they're terrific. And I can say that because I didn't have that much to do with that. I sort of consulted on them a little bit, but they're really a terrific series of videos. And then the second project I want to talk about is um, a grant that uh, you just got awarded what a few days ago. Um, and uh, do you want to just, or do you want me to? Oh, yeah. I'm too tired to read it out. Right. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll read them out then. It's uh, right. Um, it's the basic idea is that um, a, a group of researchers here at UBC are going to be bringing modelers together to talk about ways that um, public participation in uh, health economic modeling can be improved. Is that reasonable? okay? So that's uh, uh, that, those are two things that uh, that um, Stephanie and I have both been involved in. Um, both of them are uh, funded by Michael Smith. And both of them are uh, pretty much Stephanie's brainchild. Um, great, and I'm happy to take questions about any of that. Is this on? Okay, hi. I don't know if I need the mic, but I, uh, I'll, uh, thanks for that. Very interesting. Uh, one of the things that came up in your talk was you talked about how certain modeling choices uh, imply, I guess you use language like unequivocally certain moral judgments. And I guess I would just want to push back a little bit on that and wonder if you think there's a role, a role here also for thinking about the kind of practical limitations that go into these models, right? It isn't, I might not even be aware that I've made a kind of value judgment and leaving out a certain uh, variable or something in my model, maybe until someone points it out to me. Uh, so it seems like in a lot of cases, uh, the, the practical also mixes in here with the values, right? Is that, that's I, I think I did have a slide where I talked yeah. about that, right? I think what I said was, what I said was something like, look, um, sure, you might be, you might be, say, doing this vaccine model that I talked about. Somebody might come to you and they might say, um, boy, you don't have race data in this. You don't have anything about the likelihood of, of uh, white people getting VITT versus indigenous people getting VITT versus uh, people of African descent getting VITT. And you might say, what do you want me to do? I just, I don't, I don't have data on that, right? Um, it's not available, right? Or there's no, maybe you might say there's just, there's just this one really crappy study that like, you know, somebody wrote in crayon uh, who's in high school, um, you know? And, and I think the, the response is always going to be, something like, well, first of all, you have one choice, which is to say, I'm just not going to do this, right? If I, if I, if I, if, the, if, if I'm being asked to, if I'm being asked to model something like this, and I think that race is fundamental to any kind of answer, that, I'm not saying in this case that's, that's the case here, right? But you can easily imagine a case where you might say something like, boy, I'm just not comfortable building a model about this if it can't have race in it. So even proceeding Right. Um, even if I even if I believe you that it's just completely impossible, right, to include this, it might be the right moral judgment to just not proceed. Now I doubt that's the case here, right? I doubt this. I doubt in this case the absence of race in that model is so. Um, but you can imagine cases, right, where I don't know, maybe it's a model about the likelihood of police shootings or something like that, and now you don't have data for race, and you might think, I'm just not going to do this, or you might think, well, that study in crayon by the high school kid, I guess maybe it's better than nothing, right? And there might, you might think that in every case, there's at least something available. It's never completely impossible, maybe, right? Or it's rarely completely impossible. Usually when someone says it's impossible to incorporate this in the model, what they mean is 
that's going to make the model way too slow because it's like too computationally expensive or the data is just really poor on this or, right, you could push them and say like, okay, suppose you were willing to make this, you know, 10 times more expensive or suppose you were willing to make this eight times less reliable. Is there some way you could add that? And I think much of the time the answer is going to be like, oh, yeah, I guess if you really make me, you know, sacrifice some of my other principles, I could do this. That's going to be a moral decision, right? Should I sacrifice my other principles so that I can include this thing that you want included? Or should I say, no, my, my, my epistemic principles here are more important than getting that thing included? Oh. Mosin? Thanks again, Eric, for a fantastic talk. Uh, so at the risk of towing the party lines, what do you think of the prospect theory? And, and if I have understood it correctly, it might indicate that sometimes people say we want something and if when you give it to them, they don't want it anymore. Like if there is inconsistency in the values that people profess, like how does it affect the entire framework? Yeah, good. Um, I'll just repeat the question, I think, just to make sure I have it right. Uh, the question I take is, isn't there evidence from prospect theory that people don't always really know what they want um, and that uh, they can be pushed around uh, by the way that you present the question to them? I don't think you added that, but, but I think that's probably, there's probably a, a, a friendly add-on to the idea of prospect theory. Um, that's an excellent question, and um, I think that's part of the reason I said early in the talk that... Um, uh, I hope nobody asks me to make a, a, an overly detailed question about how the public ought to participate in modeling, because I think that we need to do a lot more work on that. And um, I think, a, yeah, a big part of that would be uh, the question of how do you solicit people's values and how do you do it in a way, and this is, I, I hadn't really thought about this, but I think it's an excellent, you're right about this, that um, when, when you go to solicit people's values, it's pretty easy to push them around by the way that you ask them the questions. Uh, and that's just more, that's another turtle below the turtle of ways in which um, values could implement, could influence what you're doing. And you need to be careful about that. I think that's absolutely right. Um, that's not a great answer, but. And Eric, just follow up if it is okay. And who are the people, like if you are developing a model for HIV AIDS, like who yeah. do you consider to be the people? Yeah, it's, that's a that's a that's an excellent question too, right? So presumably, presumably, you have to do something like think about, um, you know, who's impacted how much and how much voice do they deserve as a result of that. So um, obviously, like if you're talking about HIV policy, then people who are at high risk of HIV are the Go ahead. Um, sorry, Eric. I, I think the online folk lost around 15 minutes of the QA part. Um, yeah, because we had, a, we had a bad mic that we finally have rectified. I apologize okay. for that. <laughs> uh, so, earlier in your talk, Eric, you talked about type one and type two error and like the probability of wrong hypothesis, the, your hypothesis going wrong, and, and so on. So, my question is. Is this framework also uh, having recommendations on, on this so-called precautionary principle in science? Or do you want to put va bring value judgment in, into like the, the arbitrary 5% threshold and p-value? How, how, how upstream you want to go? I mean, it's, I know it's out of the modeling context, but to be honest, like model is a very broad term, can also applies to the statistical models. So I'm, because you mentioned that in the earlier part of your talk, I just wanted to know your opinion on that. Yeah, so in my vocabulary, precautionary principle is a bad word. I, I'm almost never a fan of the precautionary principle because the precautionary principle is usually a way of privileging um, one set of cost of benefits and ignoring another. There's no such thing, there's no such thing as free safety against almost anything. Um, and so if you want, if you want to protect me against A, I want to know what's going to be the cost to B. Um, as far as uh, as far as like uh, you know, classical statistical testing where there's a, a predetermined uh, p-value or whatever, um, 
I could, I could go on about that for a long time. Um, I think we, you know, I think we mostly have that, uh, we mostly have that way of thinking about things so that we can have a mechanical procedure for uh, evaluating, um, you know, particularly for health outcome uh, studies. I think we, you know, we know now, we know now like how easy it is to p-hack, uh, uh, you know, p equals 0.05 or less kind of testing. And uh, I think when we're dealing with more imp like, you know, really large uh, decisions that, you know, have large impacts on everybody, I, 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 I prefer to think about things in, in a more fine-grained way and think about what our best estimates of the probabilities are so we can weigh them with the, the costs and benefits and not, and not have some kind of uh, mechanical cutoff like that. I'm not, a, I'm not a super big fan of classical statistical testing. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Similar to the most. Ah, uh, yeah, I can bring it up to you. So, similar to points that Nick and Mosin made, thinking about the the speed at which things had to happen with the COVID modeling, and also the rate at which people's opinions and attitudes will change. And so, Nick and I were talking in the car on the way here about that there's still 30,000 cases a day in the UK six months ago or 12 months ago, that was a number that scared the life out of people. And it's not scaring the life out of people anymore. Bearing in mind, things would have differed with the vaccination rate in the population, but how do you account for, for or what are your thoughts on the extent to which that will be, that people's opinions will be changing and attitudes will be changing and how you can... Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'm going to answer a slightly different question than you asked, but I think it will get to what you're asking about. So I think there were two things. There were two things that were done in whatever was it, March 17th, I think, was when Report 9 came out. Um, there, were, there were two things policymakers could have done. They could have said, we have a novel path here, and we don't know, um, we don't know, what, we don't know what we're dealing with. And so... Uh, it seems to us that the sensible thing to do is to shut everything down and give ourselves three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, a period of time which, by the way, existing kind of like, at least in the United States, CDC recommendations were, you know, like this school, six weeks closing, not so bad, you know, not, not, not a lot, lot of harm in that. Um, just that have been explicit. I said a minute ago, I'm not a big fan of precautionary principle, but I would rather if governments doing precautionary principle reasoning, be honest about it. I, I think instead what, what, what was done was um, there was what was in precautionary principle reasoning going on. And it was given a veneer of like, there's a scientific model that shows that this is good cost benefit analysis. And I think one of the consequences of that was it was really hard to dial that back. I think what you're asking about is that like, well, yeah, finally, you know, maybe finally 18 months later, people have gotten enough of a gut feel of what the pandemic is like, that they're now able to say things like, you know, I kind of want my kids to go to school. Um, it does seem like maybe that's okay now. Uh, but I think that maybe happened more slowly than it could have happened had it been more honest up front that what we were doing was being cautious rather than saying we have a model that shows if we don't do this 10 million people are going to die or whatever um is that kind of yeah, yeah. yeah for questions yeah, absolutely So when you talked about the, the, the ideal when all researchers are being transparent and, and, and doing their model, but is there, I know we don't have the answers yet, and hopefully Steph will solve all the answers in, a, in this next grant, but is there a role for scrutiny elsewhere in research? So I've, I've sat on research ethics board for 10 years. We 
every single meeting, somebody will remind somebody else, we're, we're not here to look at the analysis, we're only talking about participants. But even in peer review for grants or ethics board, somewhere else where there's going to be more scrutiny for this? Yeah, look, and so uh, you, may, you, may, you may or may not recall that at the very beginning of the talk, I said representational risk happens in um, data collection, it happens in all kinds of representational risk happens in a ton of places. I'm going to mostly talk about modeling. Um, and uh, yeah, look, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I guess probably most people's view, I, I've never done it. I've had to submit anything to it for IR, it's, we call the essays IRB, you know, review or whatever. Um, I, I get the impression that most people think it's, you know, a lot of hoop jumping that doesn't maybe add a lot. But um, insofar as it's the kind of, insofar as it's the kind of thing that we do, insofar as we're going to be uh, having ethical review of um, scientific studies, yeah, I think it's clearly a mistake to think that the only possible way in which a scientific study could be unethical is that it could harm the participants. That's crazy, right? I mean, obviously, uh, scientific studies, if so, insofar as they're policy relevant, uh, can, can cause all kinds of harm that go beyond uh, participants. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe somebody who has more experience than I have with uh, ethical review vis vis participants might have more something more useful to say about whether expanding that is a good idea or not, or whether there's a better way to do that. Um, that's kind of outside of my uh, ballpark or whatever, but it's clearly an important question that that is that what I'm saying isn't useful unless it's added. An answer to that is added to it. Absolutely. Okay, so I think we'll wrap it there. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you guys for coming.